We are here at the Neighbor Hub by Columbia Bank in Seattle's Ballard neighborhood, and we are pleased to be joined for this episode by really one of the pillars of the Ballard community. <laughs> and he's already making a face when I say that. Corey Bergman is one of the founders of My Ballard, who has gone on to greater glory at sites including breakingnews.com, owned by NBC News, and more recently as the co founder of Factal, which is a news alerting service for enterprises and companies that really applies the breaking news model to a fascinating new area. Corey, it's great to have you here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, all right. So we are going to be having a big picture discussion about the future of news and information and really the way that uh, information is spread around the world. And Corey, you have a front row seat for this in your new job and your new role as co-founder at Factal. So a lot of people knew breakingnews.com but what is Factal, and, and how can you describe it for people who might not be familiar with it? Sure, we alert companies to incidents that happen near them. So this may be a wildfire or a shooting uh, in real time, and it's about their proximity to the actual incident. So if your company has, let's say, a thousand stores around the world, and all of a sudden there's an active shooting a block away, what we do is we notify that company immediately in real time so they can take steps to alleviate any risk that might take place from being near something like that happening. So a good example happened this week. Uh, in fact, today uh, we're recording on uh, Thursday or Wednesday, Wednesday here. Wednesday, thank you, Monica. Gotcha. Here in I'm hard time keeping up uh, with the um, supposed bomb scare that was occurring at many of the different uh, famous uh, folks. Uh, you know, Obama, I think, residents, CNN, others. Tell us what that day was like for you. How did that play out? Well, and Jillian's watching here as well. We, we were uh, extremely busy, as you might imagine. There were um, many of these, and, and then there's even more that you don't know about that are believed to be suspicious packages because everyone's worried that the, this package that came to them might be something uh, nefarious. So, you know, an example of CNN evacuating in New York at uh, 30 Columbus Circle, then when we publish that in real time, we verify that it's actually occurring. We detect that information on social media. We have a, a team of journalists that then verify that very quickly, geolocate where it's happening, and then notify any of our clients who have properties nearby. Of course, this is a very dense part of Manhattan, so there's a lot of companies that have uh, stores or offices nearby. So they're able to react much faster and know what's happening uh, near them. So one of the reasons that we thought it would be fascinating to have you here in this venue, not only is the fact that you've just started a new company and you're doing some really interesting things, and we'll talk a little bit more about Factal uh, as we go on, but you and your wife Kate are known in the Ballard community where we are as the geeky suites. And that is a very inside phrase because that is the byline and the handle that you used and still use to this day on, on My Ballard, which is uh, really a, a, one of the early examples of a community news site. We're here in the uh, neighbor hub at Columbia Bank in Ballard. How many folks out there by applause are My Ballard readers and people who have followed My Ballard over the years? Yeah. So, Corey, could you draw a thread for us in your career from what you learned on My Ballard to, and, and perhaps even some of the things that you applied there that have evolved, and, and how does that compare to what you're doing now on Factal? Yeah, so when we, my wife and I moved to Ballard, was it 12 years ago? I get this date wrong. Uh, and, and we just thought that Ballard should have a, a blog that had daily news and, and the West Seattle blog was beginning to be very popular. Capital Seattle is becoming to be very popular. And uh, so we uh, just began to explore the neighborhood and write what we saw and the community began to engage. And one of the big things that really just struck us was as the, as the site grew, as more people commented, as more people were in the forum, we began to notice interesting things happen. When you have a density of people, so people who are physically close to each other, commenting on things that happen around them, if you post something that that say there's a fire at this place, all of a sudden you have people in comments saying that they're right across the street seeing this. And so there's something magical begins to happen in comments. And so that's something that we that I really took from there and have carried that on, this idea of proximity. If something is close to you, it is inherently more important to you. And it's not just a line, it's not just linear, it's nonlinear, right? The closer something is to you, all of a sudden it's super real. 
And, and you know, there, if you're semi-close, you might be rubbernecking on the road looking at that. But, oh, my goodness, something's happening right here. I really need to, to take a, uh, pay attention to it. So that traveled from my Ballard into breaking news when we created something called Proximity Alerts. Uh, which was we'd send you a notification if something happened right next to you in real time. And then now in de facto, where we've taken that methodology then and monetized it throughout as an enterprise service for companies around the world. Yeah. Corey, it sounds like you started My Ballard about a decade ago, maybe a little bit more. And in that time, we've seen the rise of services like Nextdoor, the neighborhood social network. Facebook has obviously become really popular. And I'm just curious when there's so much user generated content, especially that's hyper local, how do you compete with a small neighborhood? Blog? It's hard. Yeah, it's very hard. In fact, it's taken a big chunk of uh, attention. Um, you know, I think the, the advantage that we have is that we're grassroots and we're local and we're known and uh, we're not just a big technology company that, uh, you know, people go to. But it's, it's you know, one of the interesting uh, things is a little bit geeky, but the if you want to participate in a community, you don't want to log in every time when you open your phone and go to that site or app. And apps made it super easy because it just remembered your login. And so we noticed that people, because my Ballard didn't have the money to develop develop an app and create a great community that it was harder for people to participate. And so if you look at Facebook, obviously, they've optimized for community around sort of uh, on, on apps and Nextdoor is, has done the same. So um, that just is an example of not having the development money to be able to compete with the big guys. And then, of course, they're able to scale in ways that we could never. Yeah. So what is the status of everything at MyBallard? Are you still involved there? How does that yeah. work? So my wife and I uh, own it and uh, are now doing sales on it as well. And uh, we have uh, uh, Megan Walker, who's our editor, who has uh, been with us for off and on for quite some time and, and has been covering news for us. And I jump in every once in a while. You see Geeky Swedes in there every once in a while. So we're still involved and we love it. And, and you know, that it's it's been really a labor of love. It is not a profitable enterprise, and uh, but it's something we really enjoy. There has been so much hand wringing, especially over the past two years, about the state of the news business, fake news, and just in general, the quality of the information we get. You have such a unique perspective and vantage point on this from really the grassroots level at My Ballard to the global level now at Factal. How do you feel about the state of news in 2018? Such an easy question. Um, In three words or fewer. Yeah. It sucks. Yeah, it's not good. I mean, it's, you know, once, you, once people don't agree on universal facts, that's a problem. And it boils down to, you know, your framing. It boils down to your beliefs. It boils down to just what's happening at any given time. And so for us with Factal, we said, let's just focus on something that you better know the facts for because if something's happening nearby that poses a risk to you or your kids or your family or your employees, or your customers, you better know the facts. And that point in time, you don't care what the political leaning is from this information. You just want to make sure it's true and you want to make sure it's fast so you can make the right decisions from it. So we're not at Factal. We don't go into political fact checking, which is a very difficult area that, that has a lot of nuance to it. We're focused on did something happen? Where did it happen? How bad is it? And what does it impact? It's a fascinating position that you're in because speed is so important and so valuable to the information that you provide. And yet so is accuracy. Talk us through like a breaking story and, and how you treat that. And, you know, uh, this this is something that reporters everywhere have to deal with. But really, it's your value proposition, the speed yeah. and the accuracy. So so how do you make that work? Yeah, that's it really is. And you know, we've just built systems over the, the years and methods that we've um, created technology to be able to encapsulate as much of that as we possibly can. But the magic really is combining technology with journalists in a way that they're just really meshed together. And it's almost like they're super journalists because now we are able to detect incidents from social media and from news sources very quickly. We're able to structure that data as close as we can. And then journalists take it that last mile and say, yep, that's real. No, that's not real. Yes, it's happening here. No, it's not happening here. And that ensures that our false positives are very low, that where the accuracy is high, but we're still able to move very, very quickly. Um, you know, one of the things about speed and why it matters, a lot of folks, it's funny, say, well, you, speed doesn't matter, we should all slow down. 
personally, news consumption, we talk about that later, absolutely. But from the standpoint when something's threatening something, so here's an example. We were testing proximity alerts at breaking news. So getting notifications on your phone if something's happening nearby. And I got a notification that there was an active shooter on the Seattle Pacific University campus. And it took me just, and I was just not at the office, I, was, I don't remember where I was, and it took me just a few seconds to realize my kids are in a daycare right across the street from SPU. And so I panicked, I called my wife and I said, and then she's like, okay, I'm gonna, let me call the daycare. So she calls, she's the first person to call, and they say, the place is locked down, cops are at the door, kids are safe. And then she called me back and told me that information. But right after that, as the news stations as, had their helicopters over it, that phone line jammed. All of a sudden, parents, worried parents are calling and they couldn't get through. And so because I had that information very quickly, we were able to find out that the kids were okay. And then Kate ended up texting a lot of the other parents and telling them the same. But that's just one of many, many examples of why getting something that's very specific, very quick, and you know it's true, can you know, alleviate the, the tension of you know, not knowing is the worst, all the way up to knowing that you shouldn't go that way because you could be in, in risk. But what about the, the opposite of that? I mean, that's the best case scenario, the best case you can make for the speed of news. But the worst case is misinformation and being so committed to being first that you spread things that aren't accurate. Like, I, I remember the Boston Marathon bombing. I was on the East Coast at the time. And everyone was tweeting about it. And like 60% of what I was seeing was then later we found out wasn't true. So Absolutely. And I remember that, <laughs> that story. Uh, we, when the, you may remember there was a report of an arrest that wasn't, and CNN and AP went with that news. And at Breaking News, we, we did not publish it. We waited. It just didn't feel right. It just felt like uh, usually when there's lots of different nuance in this. Usually when the AP publishes something, news organizations quickly follow. In this case, news organizations did not, which sent the signal to us that there's something not quite right. So we we, we, call, we call it wait a beat. Well, let's just wait a beat and let it sort itself out a bit here. And in the, in the course of waiting, we deter, you know, later determined, it was, I think about five to 10 minutes later, they said that that was, you know, seems not to be correct information. Um, but it's hard, right? And that's where human judgment comes into play along with technology. And I, I'm a firm believer that, especially in real time, technology is not ready to be able to do that verification itself. Uh, but technology assisting journalists that do this and have been there and have done that. And in the case of us, it very, sounds very morbid, but we've seen uh, you know, multiple you know, shootings that involve multiple victims from the very first tweets it, over a thousand times. And so we've begun to know what types of hyperbole that eyewitnesses use and what types of things just doesn't, don't seem right about this story. And so we're able to then get closer to the facts and have a better sensibility there. So at Factual, have you ever gotten anything wrong? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what, walk we us just through started. What well, I think today um, there was a report, the AP reported that the, the device that was for Hillary Clinton was at her house and it actually was caught at the mail facility. Is that correct, Julian? Yeah. So we went back and then corrected that, that report. But the, the key thing for us is we're fast and we're transparent. If we screw something up, even if it was something reported by someone else, we, we curate with other people report, then we'll immediately say we got that wrong and, and here's what's right. This is great. We are live on location at the Neighbor Hub at Columbia Bank in Seattle's Ballard neighborhood. You're listening to GeekWire. It's the Week in Geek. And we will be right back after this break on Cairo Radio 97.3 FM. Coming to you live from Seattle's Ballard neighborhood, this is GeekWire. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> it's Todd Bishop with Monica Nicholsberg and John Cook from GeekWire, plus Corey Bergman. He is the co-founder of Factal, which is a new news alerting service for companies, alerting them to breaking news that affects their operations around the world. Corey, you just started this company. Well, you've been sort of under the covers here for a while. When did you actually found the company? Uh, last year, we yeah. incorporated. Yeah, it's been um, uh, a slow ramp up, but then over the past year, it's been full full speed ahead. But yeah, and you just publicly launched within the last few weeks. And we then just, you went yeah, right. We just yeah, I came and and told everybody we're we're alive, and this is what we've been working on, and went twenty four seven yesterday. And talk a little bit about your founding team, because you are working with folks who have a history 
uh, at breakingnews.com and nbcnews.com. Yeah, and, and Ben Tesh is co-founder, and Charlie Tillinghast are co-founders. So uh, Ben and I were, um, I, was, I ran Breaking News, and Ben ran technology at Breaking News. Uh, Charlie was the uh, head of MSNBC, so the joint venture between Microsoft and NBC, where Breaking News was born. So he gave us the, the resources and the, and the air cover to be able to go do Breaking News, which is a very different approach to news. Why would anybody link other news organizations in real time? You should always be linking ourselves. No, it's something very unique. And so we were able to, to do that on the side. And yeah, it's great to get uh, the band back together. Jillian Sanford's here. She you know, is a Breaking News. And we have, I think, a total of eight people that have worked at Breaking News that are with us again. So it's, it's great to, to see everyone back. So the question I'm sure you get asked, you're doing this reincarnation with corporate clients in mind. Will there be down the road uh, the reincarnation for the general public, something in, akin to what Breaking News yeah, was? Yeah, they, they don't pay any money. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, pay for news. That's true. Yeah. I, so, yes, there will be consumer uh, a, a consumer mobile experience, but uh, it'll be a little different than it than it was before. But yeah. absolutely. Yeah. How will it be different? Um, not going to talk about that quite yet. I mean, I think it, you know, the challenge is if you're providing a, it's like, you know, let, let's say you're a wire service and you're selling your wire service. You don't want to just like have an app that has the entire wire service in it because then why would anybody want to buy it? So um, there, there's things that will, you know, the proximity piece of it is really powerful. And, and you might imagine there's a lot of personal safety aspects about knowing what's happening near you. Um, so that's something that, you know, our mission is to protect people from harm around the world. And so for us, it's not just about focusing on corporate side. We also want to, to provide a lot of that service to individuals. Is it a news app per se? Nah, I don't know about that. But it's, from a safety perspective, absolutely, we want, we want to be there for that. Tell me about Twitter. How do you use Twitter? What sort of damage is it causing to the news business? What should they do yeah, next? Yeah, can Twitter be fixed? Yeah, what's what, what, oh, you, you spend so much time on this um, platform. How no, should people I do. We, use we it? We live on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, we do. Um, it's a powerful tool for what we do. It's, it's a, you know, they're a partner of ours, and, and that's uh, a terrific source of data. And, um, and just knowing what's happening around the world, and every news organization lives on it, and journalists live on it, and some obviously wish they couldn't. But, um, yeah, it's, it, the whole problem about moderating communities is very, very difficult. Um, even, you know, at my Ballard, and, and Silver is over there. She's, I think she's, oh, she's taking a video. You're live streaming. This is going to get us all in trouble. But, you know, so Silver, she's, uh, you know, moderates the My Ballard Facebook group, which is quite large now. And, um, you know, there's, there's just, as you know, just the tone and tenor of conversations online have changed. And Facebook, and, you know, switching from Twitter to Facebook, but yeah. Facebook has kind of taken this mantra of kind of stepping out of the responsibility that they have as being a media company. Where, where do you come down on, on that discussion? Are they a media company? Do they have a higher responsibility to curate well, and I mean, make sure that you, factual information is being provided? Do you want Facebook and Twitter deciding what's true? No. Yeah. Well, I don't think I do either. So how, what's, where's that line, right? Where, well, they don't. At what point do they tell part of the But go? earlier you said that we have to get back to a place where we have a universal agreement about facts, right? I mean, how can... It, there's a difference between deciding whether something is true and things that are just factually true or not true. Like if somebody is just on Twitter and Facebook blatantly lying, saying Sandy Hook is made up, I don't think Twitter is deciding that that's true or not. I think that is true or not. Yeah, I mean, that's and that's how they, they approach it, right? Facebook has created a network of journalists and news organizations that can then flag things that they say are not true, and then that goes into the algorithm and you know depresses or... Um, well, it depresses those things from showing up as often. Twitter is certainly more responsive now to, to that as well. But it, it, it's, 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 there are lots of shades of gray on that, as you know. And, and if you're trying to fact check what a political statement is, uh, especially if it's coming from the president or it's coming from a senator, how far do you go? You, do you, you can't necessarily ban their accounts. And so, it, I mean, I can understand for us, I mean, it's, it, you know, we want to be a trusted source of real verified information about things that happen. Um, and provide the service. So it's, it's good for our business. Um, we certainly uh, have, you know, we value them as partners and, and, and talk with them. But it's, it's just no, being, doing communities for so long, it's just, it's a hard problem. 
And you just don't want them, you know, determining what's true and what's not. Um, but you also, like you said, you don't want ethnic cleansing taking place because of really bad information that's being shared. You know, as you said earlier, the tenor has changed and the tone of the online discourse, even just over the past couple years. And we do see this at the neighborhood level even. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, absolutely. And, yeah. and it, here in Ballard, I think we see it a lot on issues related to homelessness and things where you'd want to see the community coming together to solve a problem. And yet it feels like the conversation more often divides us. What would be your recipe? And I realize we're putting you on the spot here all night. Yeah, Corey. fix it, Corey. Yeah, yeah. Corey, well, if I could do that, fix our problems. Do you, do you see any way, any hope, any sort of change in mindset among news consumers, among commentators on community sites that, that could start to to bring us together rather than pull us apart as we come together on these online uh, forums? That's it. it yeah. Is there any I mean, hope? I hope so. I think when I think. I think the, things go in cycles, I hope, and you know, we'll cycle back down a bit. But I do think that misinformation and disinformation is here to stay. I think you've seen so many state actors realize that this is very effective, and so this will just be a continual problem. As far as just you know, in neighborhood, um, that's hard. I mean, you have to invest, and it's, you know, truthfully, we don't have a ton of money to be able to hire moderators to really yeah. do the work that needs to be done. And that really, in many ways, comes down to good old fashioned moderation. Um, but here in Ballard, I mean, there's certainly a lot to talk about. And some in many cases, you know, I think there a lot of complaints are valid. And, you know, it's, so how do you let people express those complaints and not try to to, you know, again, be the one that tells everybody just to be quiet. So it's, it's always a balance. I think that idea of newsrooms being under resources is a really important one that's maybe not as uh, as part of, as big a part of the conversation as it should be, but we're dealing with really coordinated efforts to spread disinformation, but also with far less money in the news business than there ever has been and just fewer resources, fewer people to be able to really moderate content. And like one thing that's just so interesting to me about what you're doing is it's, it's kind of taking like a tangent yeah. from the news industry yeah. that is more... Uh, that you can more easily monetize. Yeah. Like, do you think that the future of news is coming up with other revenue models that yeah. then just support the news, or is there a way to actually monetize well, news? Well, you know, days? here, you know, GeekWire has done a lot that, on that front, We're doing events and and you know, more of a membership model and and being part of the community. Yeah, with you know, with Factal, I think you know what we did at Breaking News, we noticed there was a large number of users that were using us in a different way, and. It wasn't until really breaking news ended that we had all these companies contacting us and saying, we depend on you for security and safety and, and crisis communications. We would pay for something new. And we're, okay, that <laughs> sounds like a business opportunity. So, you know, I think we're one of the only uh, instances of taking journalism that was once a consumer model and then moving into a completely new market and a completely new use case and being able to monetize that. And I think that's what's really exciting. It's something the news industry's talked about for years doing. And for us, we'd spent a year talking to these companies. How would you use it? What's the use case? What problems can we solve? What tension points do you have? And so it's really that old fashioned product development, being able to take what we're good at, what the core journalism that we provide, and how we can solve their problems in a way that they'd pay for it. This is great. We are live on location at the Neighbor Hub at Columbia Bank in Seattle's Ballard neighborhood. We're talking with Corey Bergman. He is the co-founder of Factal, a new news alerting service for companies around the globe. He is also the co-founder of My Ballard, so he has lots of roots in this neighborhood. I can see that in the audience we've got some news junkies, some news hounds, some people in the news business. So when we come back, we're going to invite the audience to ask some questions oh and bring them into the conversation. <laughs> we'll do that coming up next on GeekWire on Cairo Radio 97.3 FM. Welcome back. We are live on location at Columbia Bank at the Ballard Neighborhood. Welcome, everybody. You're listening to GeekWire. It's Todd Bishop with Monica Nicholsberg and John Cook. Our guest is Corey Bergman, the co-founder of Factal. And we're going to open this up to audience questions. Let's get our first question. Please introduce yourself and your affiliation as you come up to the mic to, to ask a question. Thanks, Todd. My name is Bill Hankus from Scoop. Uh, Corey, thank you for being here. Thank you, GeekWire, for hosting this great event. Uh, Corey, 
How is your platform different from other business intelligence platforms that aggregate news and try to derive a sentiment or a signal and deliver that to corporate customers? Because I think you're doing something different. I'd love to get a really sharper focus on that. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Uh, so there's really, there's tools that do sentiment, there's tools that do trend, there's tools that do uh, social signals, and but there's no verification, right? That you don't know if it's true or not. You know that there's something that sh should have some attention against it. Uh, and then there are tools that do uh, incident reports, and the incident reports tend to be very slow. So we occupy this middle space of, of detecting and verifying it all at the same time and doing it quickly and then providing data associated with it, especially around geolocation, that then is, enables us to be able to target that information just to companies that need to know about it. So that's, that's what's really unique about us is, again, going back that speed and accuracy together is something that's really hard to do. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, go ahead. Hi there, my name's Angie and I live in Ballard and appreciate uh, what my Ballard brings to the table and have for years. I participate in a group called Speak Out Seattle that is a very grassroots organization that tries to bring people together around three of the kind of most polarizing complex issues that we're facing both locally, regionally, nationally, which is public safety, homelessness, and addiction. And the biggest challenge, uh, we try to be nonpartisan, we try to hear from a lot of voices, we try to share good information, figure out you know, which leaders and ideas to support, which to push back on what questions to ask in an informed way, what meetings to encourage people to go to. The biggest issue is that nothing really gets reported on at the very local civic level. I shouldn't say nothing, that's an exaggeration, but very little. There's a lot of opinionated blogs, there's a lot of reactions on all the neighborhood message boards. The ways that Ballard gets you know, written up, it's like, wow, that's, that's not what I experienced, that's interesting. So I'm just curious to hear thoughts on how do we get more informed and share good information at the civic level other than people just standing up and doing it yeah, for themselves. Yeah, yeah thanks Angie. Um, that's hard, right? Because it's a, it, to have news coverage, you need to pay reporters to go cover it. If you have folks volunteering, it's very hit and miss on whether or not they're going to express their own opinions or have their own frame of context in what they see. Um, so for us, you know, as we mentioned, we are not profitable, and it's we would love to hire a reporting team. I would absolutely think it's fantastic, but um, you know, all all my all my money has gone into not being paid for a year and a half working on Factual. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, absolutely, it's a huge problem. It's not only in Ballard; it's local newspapers everywhere, right? To have fewer people, fewer resources. There's lots of meetings to cover. They're not necessarily fun and exciting to have a reporter to go cover these meetings and sit in there and understand the issues and understand the nuance and be educated about how you report it. So you need to pay folks. You need to pay folks to actually do that. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, Corey, talk about your own personal media consumption. And are there any lessons from you? Because I look at your view on the world and, and you're immersed in this along with your colleagues at Factual you know, basically scanning the news every day looking. So are there lessons from that that the typical news consumer can take to be more discerning? Don't, don't do what we yeah. do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, how, how do you do it, actually? I don't know. Jillian, how do you do it? Um, she doesn't have a mic. Yeah, <laughs> all I you. know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I my if I didn't have to do what I do, I would uh, read newsletters and listen to podcasts, right? So slow media... Hmm. Um, I think is a more, um, edu you know, well, I, it has such a loaded word, educated. Um, it gives you more context, right? It gives you more understanding. The cruft kind of goes away. The small things that sounded like they were big and urgent that didn't turn out to be that important, that just they're not included. And so that's the kind of, and, and the other tip I would say is, is, <laughs> is visit news sites and sites that you like directly. Seems so old school to go to like a homepage, you know, and <laughs> look at the news. But you get a sense of context, and you don't get everyone's opinion that's attached to that content when they when they share it. Yeah, I agree with that. I've been doing a lot more of that actually, especially as I've moved my own news consumption away from Twitter, and because you just drown there, and it's not valuable, and you get sucked in directions that aren't curated. So. I do spend my, that is, I think, a great point. Spend more of your time going direct to the news sites. And I do consume newsletters that aggregate 
very well. I'm a big fan of uh, of Axios, which I think does an excellent job of curating content, um, both in technology business, but mainly in politics and news coverage. They're excellent. So that, I think, is a really important way to consume news, but also no trusted media brands. It is old school, but I think the pendulum is swinging back towards the fact that folks are so overloaded with information, at least I hope so, that they are looking for some more direction and trust. Now, of course, there's some just lost souls that are, you know, lost in their own media worlds and are never getting out of it. Uh, and maybe they're a hopeless cause or maybe you can recover them. I don't know. I want to uh, jump on the newsletter ba- bandwagon because I, I just really? keep thinking of, yeah. Because I remember, Todd, you remember this. Yes, we you had, had to get We had this me. debate I'm like totally four converted. years ago at GeekWire and Todd and I were saying, we need to boost our newsletter subscribers. And it, Taylor Soper and you, Monica Nicholsberg, were saying, <laughs> no, we need we need to go heavy on social, 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 <laughs> I know, social. I know. Well, maybe I'm getting old or yes. maybe I've just come around. <laughs> You're not getting but, old. But Taylor, the reason Taylor's, I brought it up. Yeah, sorry, yeah, is Taylor Taylor's lurking behind me about ready to hit me over the head? head. <laughs> The reason I bring it up is because I, I was going to ask um, Corey and, and the rest of you, since Corey's kind of in the hot seat, a question, but then I, I answered it for myself, which is what if I only have 10 or 15 minutes a day to consume the news? And I think in that case, finding one or two newsletters from a newspaper or a trusted media source that you can get delivered to you instead of having to seek it out and that aggregates the news in a really effective way, I think is a super smart way to stay up to date versus just kind of jumping into your echo chamber of social media. I'm glad how you came full circle, by the way, Monica, to, to, <laughs> the, to the lights that we, yes. <laughs> you know, there are times when I get home and talk about old school, uh, my wife and daughter and I, for a few years there, we would watch, this will give you a sense for the era, Brian Williams and NBC News every night. And it felt like I was sitting there with my TV dinner on my TV tray back in the 1950s at times. But I think there's a real value in something highly produced, well-reported, that just summarizes it like that. And, you know, I know it's old school, but it's broadcast TV and it's the ultimate cable cutters, you know, the cord cutters dream because you can get it over the air. I mean, there is a certain advantage to that. And I'm willing to sit through some ads for, uh, you know, the uh, advanced age uh, pills or whatever. I can't, Todd, I can't you are so on. politically <laughs> correct. Some oh Enbrel, my gosh. My Enbrel ads. <laughs> can, can I do you one better on that? Yes. yes. I have a couple of friends who are in their 20s and they absolutely love watching PBS NewsHour. That's there their favorite well, way to get their program. news. And yes. I, I mean, I think they're probably outliers, but I kind of love it because I would love to see news go the same way as like Polaroids or vinyl where it's this like analog old school reaction to getting so digitized that we've like lost touch with substance. I mean, the next thing you knew, people know, people are going to be like putting quarters in a box and pulling a piece of paper out again. I don't know. That's, <laughs> I don't so, even understand that reference. Corey, I just <laughs> I, I had a question for you since you have been so plugged into breaking news for so long and have watched so many things unfold. What are the two or three breaking news moments that have oh, really resonated in your own life that have stuck with you? Off the and top why? of your head, Corey. Well, I'm <laughs> sure it's like what, like a moment in the newsroom where you, like you rallied or things hit you and, um, and have stayed with you. Um, that's hard. We've, we've seen a lot, you know. Which one? Paris, Paris yeah. Paris was a... I, I, there, there were, there's been instances, and this also happened at the Pulse nightclub shooting, the Bataclan and the Pulse nightclub, where on social media, you see people begging for the cops to come in. Hmm. That was just something that stuck. And the cops are outside, they're trying, they're mobilizing, they're getting ready. And the folks inside are saying, come in now. And that was just really, really hard. Hmm. And it since actually, um, David Wiley, who's our managing editor in London, was telling me the other day that London has taken that to heart and have fast uh, response police teams now that are aimed at that very problem, that they are at helicopters and move very quickly and will move in very fast if that sort of situation were to happen again. Which does speak to the the power of media and how everybody's a uh, journalist really at this day and age. I mean, you think 40, 50, 100 years ago at moments in history, people weren't able to broadcast or share moments in real time. So that is amazing that that is actually able to occur. And it's nice to hear that you're trying to use some of that power for good uh, to help people. 
Yeah, I mean that keeps it go- keeps us going, right? Is the is the fact that by looking at all the bad things in the world, uh, we're able to do to do good through it. And, and at the end of breaking news, all the notes that we were given from folks who were you know hunkered down in a in, in the Nice France story was another one where actually both Julian and I were on at the time and. We were the first in the world to break that story, um, and we sent the proximity push notification to everybody who had the app that were there. And it turns out there were quite a few. They were there for the a celebration that was taking place, and and so we had lots of stories of people followed up an email saying they were hiding in a building, thinking that there were shooters on the loose. And then when we reported that the the one person who was driving the truck had been stopped by police, then the sense of relief that came over everybody. Huh. Because everyone just sort, sort of seems to think that if you're at a location that someone's just notifying you what's happening, it just doesn't happen. Actually, in many cases, kids in schools, people who are just hiding in closets, they just don't know. And there's no one telling them. So being able to give information that's verified and is targeted to them that they can trust and know that, okay, this is what's happening is a great relief to them. And, for, and you know, it's a service that really no one else can provide. As we mentioned at the beginning, Corey, you've seen this community in Ballard just basically transform. All of us have seen it transform over the last 10 years. And I realize that it's a very, that's a very local story, but I think it's also emblematic of what's happened in Seattle and frankly in communities around the world as the tech industry has come in and really transformed things for better and for worse at the same time. When you look around this neighborhood, what are your thoughts here in 2018? Oh, I knew that question was going to come. Um, you know, when we first started my Ballard, it was a sort of old Ballard, new Ballard, right? So w- the first big story was the Denny's was torn down. And then it was Sunset Bowl was torn Oh, my God. I was right. there on the last night. On oh, man. There you go. Right? Oh, so, that was are you going to talk point. about the Viking next? Oh, oh no. My I, God. I, I wasn't, but now that you're going to. Yeah. And so it was this, you know, but again, it's about generations and framing. And if you've lived here for a very long time, this is bad. If you just moved here and you got a cool hip apartment that's right next to, you know, old Ballard, it's super awesome. Why would anybody be complaining about this? Um, But as time has gone on, it's now about the impact of all that growth, right? Now that the growth has happened, the population has increased. Now you see more homeless. Now you see, uh, you know, there's a debate over this, but anecdotally, and I fully believe it, there's more petty crime here by far um, that that there were years ago. So you have a place where, you know, Ballard historically has taken on disproportional amounts of growth. If you look at growth numbers in North Seattle, Ballard is the place where all the growth has happened. So I think the people here rightfully are, you know, frustrated with that. And they've seen the impacts of that. And because it's on the leading edge of that, for at least for this part of Seattle, they've just expected a little more, you know, responsiveness from, from the city and from others that can help, uh, you know, alleviate that, that change. So it's just, there's a lot of, I think, valid concerns and, I can see it from, you know, watching the growth. And, but I also understand people's different perspectives. Just the old Ballard, new Ballard thing was really fascinating for both Kate and I to watch that come about. All right. One, last thing here, just to acknowledge our live stream audience. We have a question from Patrick Husting who says, hi, he needs breaking geek news. And he also asks, how do you take the bias out of the news? He's very tired of just the left versus right. John, let's ask, let's have you answer that one so Corey doesn't have to oh, be geez, on the hot come on. Why, why do I have to get on the Corey's hot seat of that? That's a tough one. I like one. I mostly, breaking geek news. Should we yeah, collaborate? That's right. Exactly. Yeah, let's collaborate, Corey. At least wanted let's to launch igno- a joint venture here together. <laughs> I wanted to acknowledge Patrick's question at least. Yeah, I don't know. That's I, I think that's I think that's hard to do. I think it gets back to what we were talking about earlier is choosing your media sources wisely as a consumer and putting trust in those sources. I'll tell you, I had a fascinating experience this past week, just briefly. We're working on a new podcast called Numbers Geek. It's in uh, partnership with Steve Ballmer's nonprofit organization, USA Facts. And I went down to the big political conference in Los Angeles, Politicon. And so it was Ann Coulter, Chris Christie, you know, the uh, Josh and Toby from the West Wing. They were all there. And I went down Avenatti. there. Avenatti. Yeah, Michael interview- Avenatti. Yeah. I chased down Michael Avenatti in a hallway, um, one of the great accomplishments of my journalistic career. And I, <laughs> my, my joke to him was, I'm, I'm the only one who's not going to ask you about Stormy. And, uh, I thought anyway. you were going to say, I'm the only one who hasn't interviewed yet, you yeah. yet. Lydia. Exactly. <laughs> but my whole mission was to bring facts and data to the conversation. And I got up and I asked Ann Coulter a question during the Q&A session. And you'll hear this on the podcast when it comes out. And I was ready with the immigration numbers, like the actual government immigration numbers. And 
I asked her what the important numbers were to her, and I was going to follow up with the real numbers, and she just went off, on, and she basically said, the government numbers are fake. They're fake. And half the people I talked to, because I would ask them, do you know how many people or what percentage of the population is uninsured? And it's 8.8%. And, and people were saying it's 70%. And I said, well, no, it's actually 8.8%. And they said, some people talk about fake news. We think they have a, we have a fake government. And so there's this challenge. There's this challenge. It, it, people are so partisan, so divided that they don't even want to agree on the basic facts. And I don't know how we get Can there. Can you solve that one, Corey? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, yeah, yeah the, the political side of it is super hard. Yeah, yeah. that's it's very difficult. Yeah, absolutely. So at any rate, I think the more conversations we have like this, the more we talk about the importance of agreeing on a common set of facts, as you pointed out at the very beginning, the, the better. So, Corey Bergman, where can people find you and where can they follow you? Oh, for like social media, like Everything. Twitter? Like, and we it, just yeah. told everybody What's that the best? you should yeah. probably yeah. lay off that a bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, at Corey B on Twitter. Yeah. C-O-R-Y-B-E. Yeah. B-E. And it's factal, F-A-C-T-A-L dot com. Correct. And you were able to get that domain like you probably spent 11 bucks for it on, on GoDaddy, right? <laughs> well, it wasn't 11 bucks, but it wasn't super expensive. We were actually pretty uh, yeah. surprised we were able to get it for a reasonable amount. Very cool. Yeah. Well, it's so fascinating to see the evolution of your career and how it touches all these different areas from local to global. So it's been great to have you here. Thank big, you. Big round of applause for Corey Bergman. Yes. And a big thank you to our audience here at the Neighbor Hub at Columbia Bank in Seattle's Ballard neighborhood. Be sure to check this place out. It's the coolest bank I've ever been in. And a big thanks to them for hosting us for the past three live episodes here. I will say we also have a giveaway to the, a lucky member of the audience chosen at random. I do know, I happen to know the winner. I had no hand in picking the winner. Uh, it is not, yes, yes. Okay, so the, the giveaway that we are going to be doing is a pair of tickets to Cirque du Soleil in Redmond, and it's the Cirque du Soleil Volta. Volta. Volta, and the winner is John Rep. So congrats to John Rep, chosen at random. <laughs> uh, a veteran of the news business himself. In fact, some people in the Seattle region will recognize John's name from the radio. So, uh, well, congrats to John. So it's great to have you here. Thank you. All right. Oh. Plug the podcast next week. Okay. All right. Also, a quick reminder, GeekWire will be on location in... Renton. Renton, We're going Washington. To Renton. We're going to Renton. I'm calling it HQ3. That's right. Uh, we're going <laughs> to be on location in Renton as part of a larger project that will be announced on the site this weekend. Uh, GeekWire's Taylor Soper will be in Renton reporting on the evolution of that community as kind of an icon of the way the rest of the region and the world are evolving. And we will be doing a podcast live there next week, November 1st in the evening. You can go to geekwire.com slash events to find out more. And we'll be looking forward to seeing you there, especially if you're in the community of Renton. And we'll be doing a live stream as well from that location. Anything I missed? Okay, perfect. All right, once again, a big round of applause to the audience here in Ballard. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you next time on GeekWire.